Uh, one final thing. One of the uh, primary myths that uh, status will uh, use as a justification for the state is if you didn't have a monopoly on violence, you would have like all these people with competing worldviews and this would be very chaotic. What you need is a center of objectivity where there's just one rule that applies to everyone. So at least people know what it is. It's far from perfect, but at least people know what it is. The response to this that one of the many, but the one that I've focused on is called The Myth of the Rule of Law by John Hasness, where he says, what you think is objective law is not really that at all. Even the very First Amendment judges don't agree on what constitutes a violation of the First Amendment or the Second Amendment, let alone legislation that's thousands of pages long that no one's ever read. When it comes to this myth of the rule of law as an attorney, have you come across this in your uh, field where two judges can look at the exact same case and judge differently? Every day. Yeah, every single day. That's just the way it goes. I mean, uh, you there's something called discretion, an abuse of discretion. So essentially, when um, when a judge is hearing a set of facts and one side argues, you know, mom shouldn't have the kids, uh, you know, 50 50 because she was doing drugs and she has these pending criminal co convictions. And then the other side, well, dad shouldn't have the kids because, you know, he took them to Coney Island and left them alone or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. the judge needs to look at the facts and decide, well, which one should have the kids and which one should make the choice. As long as the judge is within a certain spectrum, the appeals court can't overturn he or she. Um, and so unless they failed to look at the facts and apply the standard of law and reach a reasonable result, then the appeals court will stamp, you know, they will not overturn that decision. And, and so when you have other things that are a little more esoteric, like uh, a complex contract negotiation, like take this Steven Crowder situation in the Daily Wire. Yeah. If, if Steven Crowder had signed the contract and there was a certain clause that was ambiguous, and we, we, we already have heard arguments from both sides, right? They've been going back and forth about these censorship terms and about how much money Crowder would lose if he didn't post a certain amount of episodes and, and all these things. If a judge were looking at it, both of the sides could make reasonable, correct arguments. But at the end of the day, one has, you know, the judge has to choose one argument over the other. And there's no objective truth about which one made the better argument. It really depends on what it is. And so we see that when, when the rubber meets the road with a law at any time, that is the reality of the situation, that there's no objectively correct answer. And especially at the beginning of that term sheet where it said Crowder will produce 192 episodes. Well, the number 192 is pretty objective. And then it goes on to say of equal or greater uh, value than, you know, it, it was basically saying he has to maintain the quality that he's currently produced. Show me the objective uh, example of maintaining quality. Yeah. Seinfeld season one versus season five versus season nine. I, I mean, c come on. Th that's so ambiguous, but that's just the nature of reality under any system that's yeah. going to occur, which is why it's so dangerous to have a coercively funded monopoly in something so vitally important.